So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Please be seated. My grandmother loved these words from the song that we have just sung. Life is short, she would say, and it's getting shorter for me, for you, for all of us. She was not one to lecture, but she did ask questions. And she would ask, what, what is our living for? She had suffered and known loss like all of us. And she took the psalm as an occasion to reflect on what we're doing with the life that is given us, what we are doing with the time that is given us. It's a psalm that I return to, um, and I find myself more and more moved as I read it, thinking always of my grandmother. More than ever, the words bring strength and solace and challenge and renewal. Psalm 90, uh, the prayer of Moses, the man of God, is one of the oldest writings in the Bible, and scholars think of it as the first great masterpiece of the Hebrew hymn book. Uh, we believe Moses wrote the prayer in the wilderness on the way from Egypt to Canaan. It's a meditation on the transience of life and the human condition on our human situation. Moses is the great founding leader, and yet he is but human. He's given the great lifespan of 120 years, proverbial, and yet he is but mortal, never to enter the promised land. God is eternal, but we measure our time by morning and evening, by days and nights. And our time is marked by labor, suffering, and sorrow. In the morning, the grass is green, is flourishing. In the evening, it withers and dies. We're swept away like a dream, fading away like the grass. And yet, we are told, God's loving kindness makes it possible for us to have a different experience of time, a different experience of life, where our days become years in a round of joyful fulfillment in the course of time that we are given. Satisfy us by your loving kindness in the morning, so shall we rejoice and be glad all the days of our life. So we find a different kind of flourishing from the grass that sprouts in the morning and withers. God's loving kindness moves our joy beyond the span of hours to all the days of our life. May the graciousness of the Lord our God be upon us, prosper the work of our hands, prosper our handiwork. This psalm moves us to ask, since we must die, what does it mean for us to fulfill our desire to live? What does it mean to number our days, to apply our hearts to wisdom? How do we bring self to bear as we carry our lives? If my grandmother would ask, what is our living for? What is the work of our hands? Uh, my grandmother found the work of her hands. She mastered the arts of homemaking. She cooked, she canned, she quilted, she sewed. She knew how to do many things many of us don't know how to do. She shared the stories and the songs of our elders, her parents, their parents, their names, their ways, their skills. She cared for family and friends. She nursed them through illness. She was with them as they died. She was what I think of as an essential other in her church. It was a small Episcopal congregation, um, and it was surrounded by the Amish and Mennonite communities of Mishawaka, Indiana. My grandmother embodied what I think of as the, the practical charity, the hospitality, the neighborliness that the Gospels ask of us. Um, scripture describes the first creation as a garden. My grandmother was a gardener. Um, I love natural history. I love ferns and birds and flowers and rocks and trees. And I trace my experience of the world as holy to our time together digging in the dirt. Um, we were surrounded in the spring by daffodils, hyacinths, lilacs, persithia, magnolias. This was, for me, revelation not from above, but from below, through experience. My grandmother brought the world to me. Um, she introduced me to the gifts of soil 
of water, of sun, of light. We live through the kindnesses and the sacrifices of others, she showed me. And we grow through the traditions of memory and story and song and wisdom. We hand one another along, uh, as Robert Coles puts it. We develop habits of reverence, a sense of wonder and mystery as we celebrate the gifts of life. We cherish the joy and the glory of what is before us. We taste the sweetness of this life. I'm talking about my grandmother this morning, not only because of our song, but because of all of you. I continue to realize, rediscover, keep alive what my grandmother gave me through our experience of our community here at St. Peter's. Through all of you, I think of the work of our ministers, our greeters, our ushers, our acolytes, our readers, intercessors, the members of the altar guild, the flower guild, I think of our money, money counters, our hosts at the coffee hour, I think of our outreach projects here in Lakeview, the pantry, the night ministry, our work with Northside County, I think of Cathedral Shelter, I think of our choir, our shared experience with the arts through the activities of the cultivators uh, and the projects of John Dowling. We find, all of us, I think, different points of entry into our community. Strange and faithful moments move us in quite different ways and quite different directions. At the start of the month, Father Bunkerby, uh, on St. Michael's Day, spoke of uh, his experience of angels and how he came to St. Peter's. And for many of us, I want to emphasize in our season of stewardship, the practice of ministry deepens our experience of grace and gratitude beyond the bounds of what we could ever imagine. Uh, I know this from my own experience. Uh, five years ago, I joined our choir. And while my sight reading remains uneven at best, <laughs> I can assure you that the experience only deepens my appreciation of word and sacrament as we move through the seasons of the church here. And I continue to deepen my experience of community, my sense of connection with all of you here and now, and also my sense of connection with my grandmother, uh, her parents, earlier generations, my father. We hand one another along in different ways. St. Paul reminds us that we are members of one another. And we realize, we discover this truth, this fact, as we carry out acts of love and kindness and celebration in a community of care. Um, again, I know this through experience. My father died last March. He was 91. He had been ill uh, for many years, and I felt, I thought, prepared for his death. Uh, and I don't believe that we are ever prepared. And I can't tell you how much the condolences, the kind words, meant. And I also can't tell you how much it meant to come to our choir rehearsal uh, the night of his funeral and sing with our choristers uh, from the hymnal that he so loved. Um, another experience, this July, uh, my partner, Alan, and I renewed the vows that we made here at St. Peter's 26 years ago. And there were those that was with us in July who were here a quarter century ago. I think this is amazing. I think, um, I, I was uh, just looking at the the video, uh, the uh, the video clips of parishioners talking about our experience here at St. Peter's, and certainly one experience that's central for so many of us is that of community. I think our experiences of community mean so much to so many of us because we live in a culture that fails to celebrate the gifts of life, a culture that overrides, undermines, destroys the gifts of connection, the gifts of relationship. As we join ourselves with the living, as Ecclesiastes puts it, 
as we give ourselves over to one another. The gifts of life are made real. We are a blessing to one another the moment we give ourselves over to the care of one another. We come to know the love that brought creation into being. It's a love that is made real, that becomes true in our experience of growth and healing and renewal and strength as we come to terms with fate, circumstance, suffering, and loss. It's a love that sustains us, that holds us in our very being as we do our very best to bring self to bear, to carry out our lives, and to apply 